Welcome back to Beyond Film School, where I teach you all about the film industry. I'm Amber, and in this video, I'm going to break down the writer's strike. <laughs> Starting on March 20th of this year, of 2023, the WGA, Writers Guild of America, will commence negotiations with AMPTP, the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers. Now, if you're in the film industry, you have probably heard, read, or seen someone say there's gonna be a strike. And they've been saying this for the past couple months now. Now, everyone thinks there's gonna be a strike, but negotiations have not started yet, so we don't know if there's actually going to be one. But this anxiety is there because everyone, like we humans like to do, industry-wide, everyone is mentally preparing for the worst. And that could be work stoppage, production halts, basically everyone out of the job for an unknown period of time. The anxiety does not go unjustified as this has indeed happened in 2007-2008 when the Writers Guild of America and AMPTP did not come to an agreement. This was when streaming services started to really boom and they really started to grow and new media became a new section of the entertainment industry. Movies and TV shows had a brand new area to do syndication and the studios were making bank. And the writers and respectfully everyone else who received residuals from those contracts when those shows were being resold to the streaming services in different markets around the world, they were not <laughs> getting that money. And this goes without saying, but that was a huge problem for the writers. For 100 days, the writers were on strike from November 5th to February 12th of that year. Some of the things that came out of that strike was the residuals for new media and overall residuals went up. The base minimum wage also went up and they got rid of that weird packaging that agents did to the writers, directors when they sold a lovely package deal to certain movies and studios and like they would get like a kickback. They, the agents would get money from the studio so they put an end to that. Yes, film production stops when there's a strike, but what actually happens and how does it affect the things that come on your screens? Firstly, let me just say that when a strike happens, film production doesn't immediately halt, doesn't immediately stop right when the strike happens. Secondly, what I will say, it doesn't affect everything equally because of the turnaround and the fast turnaround that it takes to make a TV show, 45 minute to an hour TV show could take eight or nine days, whereas a hour and a half movie would take like six months. So there's a longer lead time that affects movies where the writer's strike would not affect movies the same way. It definitely has a more direct effect on TV shows than it does for movies. Sometimes movie releases will be delayed, but other than that, TV is largely affected by a strike. What'll happen on TV shows is that they will shoot completed scripts. They will shoot whatever is completed but the writers will not be on set. Now, if you know anything about TV, you know that rewrites happen all through the process, even up to when they're ready to roll. So those nice little rewrites that you get where a plot might be nicely packaged, there might be some things that are lacking <laughs> <laughs> because the writer wasn't there to kind of rewrite the scene to make it all make sense. So sometimes the plot lines will suffer. Once there's no more completed scripts, there's nothing else to shoot. <laughs> so there's a small gap from strike to work stoppage. Well, the studios, networks, and production companies gotta make something. They gotta make that money. <laughs> and what comes to save the day? Reality television. <laughs> In 2007 and 2008, with the last Royal Strike, reality TV really amped up. Established reality shows that already had seasons had additional seasons greenlit faster, meaning they had more than one season in one calendar year. Some of the shows were The Amazing Race, Big Brother, Good News Week, and The Price is Right. Also, The Apprentice. If you guys have forgotten about this show, <laughs> this is your lovely reminder that this is where Donald Trump came from. But in 2007, 2008, that first season of The Apprentice did not do that well. During this time, they had a lot of additional airtime. They greenlit another season of The Apprentice. They put a celebrity twist on it and then they got a hit show. So we can thank the writer's strike for giving us Donald Trump. You're fired. 
If it wasn't for all that additional airtime, I don't think The Apprentice would have seen another season. So they would have had one season, it would have been down in the water, and we have never seen the success of The Apprentice. But you also got a lot of really bad reality shows. Like, they're uh, the, the clash of the choirs. Five music superstars on a mission. You gotta find people to join our choir. Are you gonna audition for the choir? Please come up and sing your butts off. To return to their hometowns and put together a choir. Probably the toughest thing I've ever had to do. And your dad is better than my dad. And he's off. Keep in mind, this is the easiest and slowest spinning of the four discs. Oh, he misses on the first shot. Makes the second for a nice 20. Some weird reality shows definitely came out of the writer's strike. They had to fill that airtime, so they're kind of desperate, and they greenlit basically anything that was going to fill those slots. Some other effects of the last writer's strike is some shows, they were greenlit and then just died. Some shows hired non-union writers. We don't like that. <laughs> Some shows' seasons were cut short, and because of that, those plot lines, the storylines of that show were largely affected as well. And that brings me to Breaking Bad. Season one of Breaking Bad was when the writer's strike was happening. We lost two episodes. Two. We lost two episodes of Breaking Bad, and I'm a fan of Breaking Bad, and if you are, you know that you wanted those two episodes of Breaking Bad. It's rumored that in season one of Breaking Bad, Vince Gilligan wanted to kill off Jesse Pinkman, but actually that's sort of a rumor that's partially true. That was an original plotline, but Vince Gilligan liked Aaron Paul so much they wanted to keep him on the show. And because we did not have those two episodes of Breaking Bad, it 100% affected how that season story was told. If there are happens to be a strike. There might be some strange reality shows, might be some good ones, might be some new hit reality shows, we don't know. We could see seasons cut short, we could see plot lines and the overall arc of a story just not go as well as it could have. But what also you'll see is that productions will go internationally as well. The WGA does not have any jurisdiction outside of the US. Studios have definitely denied this, but there has been talk that studios are stockpiling and buying up all the completed scripts that they can. On the other end with the writers, it has been said that they are pushing their agents when it comes to selling their scripts to finalize those deals as quickly as possible before this impending doom of the strike happens. Also, some writers rooms for shows have already started way before their scheduled start date, which that will also pull up production, which they're trying to fit in as much as they can before that May 1st end contract. Apparently, studios have been preparing for this since summer of 2022. So the studios know that the writers are pissed off and they definitely know something that we don't. And that definitely is what is causing the anxiety of why everyone thinks a strike is going to happen this year. So what are the things that the writers are asking for this contract? They want to raise the base minimum pay, which is not outside of normal. It's pretty usual to do that because every three years there's a new contract. We have to compensate for inflation, cost of living, so that's pretty normal. They also want a higher percentage when it comes to residuals. These studios make some crazy money, and I say yes, get a higher percentage, because without you writing that script, we don't have a show. We have no scripted, narrated TV or movies. Without your script, we got nothing. So I say ask for higher residuals. Now let's talk about mini writer's rooms. This is a very heated issue. And if we're honest, it's gonna be the main thing that's gonna be battled over. So I have to jump into how TV was traditionally made to give you a comparison to the mini writer's room. How TV is usually made is like they go into development, they write a pilot. That pilot will then go to the studio and they'll say, yes, let's put this pilot in production. They spend millions of dollars, they make this pilot. Based off that pilot and how it does or what people think of it, they will order the rest of the season to be made. So the writers that are attached to that pilot, they would essentially be employed for the rest of the season if that pilot got picked up for the rest of the season. Now, if we're talking about mini writer's rooms, what happens now is that a showrunner and the, slash the creator will get in, have a lovely room of a couple writers, maybe a few, maybe like less than a handful of writers. They'll get together, they will write the pilot, the first few episodes, they're gonna write all the characters arts, all the plot lines, and they're gonna extend it out for the whole season. Where is the story going for the whole season, not just that pilot? So that is then packaged, then that is shown to a studio, and then the studio will decide whether or not they want to take on that show. Based on those mini writer's room, then that's where that straight to series order comes from. For this, they don't risk all the money and make the pilot. They 
they take it all into consideration and say, yes, this will be most likely a successful show. This eliminates the pilot stage. This also eliminates the risk involved in the money that they might lose if the pilot doesn't do well and if they don't want to pick up the show. If they don't want to greenlit the show, they just lost all the millions of dollars they put into making that pilot. Now, if you look at it from the producers and the studio standpoint, it makes sense. You're taking a better calculated risk on whether or not that show is going to do well. Instead of just making the pilot, you're going to really look at the whole thing. I think that if I were investing in a show, I want to know where the show is going. So on the studio producers end, it just makes sense for them to kind of see the whole scope of the show rather than just the pilot. For me, it just makes sense on an investment standpoint. But from the writer's perspective, they are not getting the same rates like they would if they were in a traditional writer's room on a regular traditional TV show where it's the whole span, they do, they do it the traditional way. They're not getting the same rate. Like honestly, F that, I want the same rates that I would be getting. I'm still writing the show, I want my money. Give me my goddamn money. These mini writer's room, they could go from a few weeks to several months before anything even is even promised to go into production. And also these writers aren't guaranteed anything. So you can be a writer in one of these rooms and you can build the world of this show. You can help build all the stories, all the plot lines, all the character arcs. You can help build the world, but then once it goes into production, you are not guaranteed to be one of those staff writers. I'm sorry, but no. Nope. They're also putting in all this work for several, several months for that show not to be greenlit. And it almost feels like, I mean, every writer wants to be on a show that's successful and actually goes to production. Another issue of these writers' rooms is that they normally have a lot more inexperienced writers. Now, if you are just starting out, this might be really, really great for you. If you are desperate for your big break, I get it. We want to work. We want to make our dreams come true. I think that Producers and studios definitely prey upon that because they know if you are an experienced writer, you most likely, nine times out of 10, will negotiate less and you will settle for less money. And less money than one of the experienced writers. You are willing to work for less just to get your foot in the door. For the WGA themselves, they actually have a lot of things on their website that give advice to the members of their guild to say, hey, make sure you're negotiating for something guaranteed if it gets Greenlit. They are offering tips for their members to make sure they don't get taken advantage of because from their standpoint, a mini writer's room is still the same as a traditional writer's room. They want to look out for their members and they want to make sure that they are paid what they are worth. From the words of the WGA, a mini writer's room is still a writer's room. The process of the mini writer's room is a lot less risk for the studios. So while it is a hot button issue, if they just want the normal rates as traditional writer's room, I don't I don't think that is so uh, like earth shattering or mountain moving for them to kind of fix this issue. I think they can quickly do that. I don't think this is going to be a massive undertaking and it shouldn't take a lot to actually fix this issue on the producers and studios end. I don't predict this battle being a halt for production because when production is halted and there's a work stoppage, everyone loses, including the studio. They lose a lot of money when production stops. I think there's going to be a lot of negotiations for sure, but work stoppage, I'm hoping it doesn't get to that. And if it does, then I mean, I definitely stand with the Writers Guild because the amount of money that studios make versus what the writers are getting is kind of crazy. They can always negotiate upwards, but they got to fight for that, that base payment, those residuals, percentages. How do you think this is going to pan out? Now, negotiations are going to start, like I said before, March 20th. The contract that is currently in place, that ends May 1st. So we're soon going to see how this is all going to go down. Let me know in the comments what you think <laughs> of this whole situation. Do you have anxiety about it? Are you worried? Are you worried about being on the job? What have you heard who knows we're all over the country it definitely affects all of the u.s we all have writers everywhere and remember it is the writers guild of america we also have the dga my guild directors guild of america are also going to be in negotiations after the wga so who knows what's going to happen this is all very strange this year because usually the DGA would negotiate first, but we decided to go last this year um, coming up to talk to the AMPTP. So I don't know, the, the atmosphere is a little weird, <laughs> but let me know what you think in the comments and let's see what we think about this battle that's gonna happen. That is it for now, I shall see you next time.